Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 47. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, where we extract the signal from noise. Every week we break down what's happening in the enterprise and tech scene. Uh, here I'm in Palo Alto, California. Dave's in Massachusetts. Dave, great to see you. Hey, John. Seven, a lot of news. Getting it done Thursday this week. A lot of, a lot of plans on Friday, a lot of meetings. Um, you know, real big news going on. We saw Meta added two board members. One of them, Hock Tan from Broadcom. Tons of commentary on that. Um, as well as a lot of AI news, you got uh, open AIs, develop a tool to create realistic AI videos. Also, Sam Altman started a little VC fund on his own. A lot of stuff going on around open AI. Just so much stuff to go. It's just out of control. It's all good. Uh, but uh, but on a, on a silicon angle, media note, as co-founders, I got to tell you, I'm pretty proud of this, Dave. We just announced um, the continued growth of our rebranded research team led by you with Wikibon, which we rebranded to, to the Cube Research um psyched to announce the appointment of david lindicum as our principal analyst a testament to our relentless pursuit of excellence and growth high integrity individual really kind of cements his reputation of being such a great commentator and analyst and consultant at deloitte he's seen many ways of innovation and again you know just from a personal standpoint with all the noise out in this analyst relations market these days where people are questioning you know integrity um reputation um it just really puts us to an exclamation point on on our trajectory and growth around the trust that we built in the tech community with the Cube and SiliconANGLE and Wikibon now Cube Research, you know, and redef continuing to redefine and innovate AR, PR, and and media. So, big news, and there's more coming. I wish I could really more more news, but there's more coming. Really excited. There is more coming. It really best is yet to come. Really excited about that, John. I was talking to David the other day, and I got to know him a little bit. Um, with the whole super cloud mean, he had a term called meta cloud, which aligned very well with the super cloud and the, in the uh, abstraction layer. So we were doing a little bit of collaboration there. I got to know him. He came on at RSA last year. He knows security. And we were talking the other day and I was like, so what would you say is, are kind of your top areas of expertise? And I love it because like us, you know, he's been around, he, he knows a lot of different technologies, cloud, AI, observability, security, Basically, he said anything enterprise tech. He's a five five time CTO, you know, coming out of Deloitte, and so deep deep and wide expertise. And I'm really excited to be working with him. Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of commentary on LinkedIn. Well, perfect fit. Um, happy, to, and, and then David's certainly happy to be on the focus. He's he really is my, admires the work we've done. Um, just some CMOs that worked with over the years. Best team ever. Can't wait to see what you guys do together. Just the consistent commentary of just a good fit and. You know, um, with the era we're living in is going to be moving to influence is going to come from reputation, not attention and gimmicks. So um, you're going to see that. And again, our audience is up on Silicon Angle. The traffic's growing. So I want to take this moment to thank everyone who's been on this journey with us. If you're listening and are new to Silicon Angle and the Cube, check out SiliconAngle.com, thecube.net, and thecuberesearch.com. Uh, we've been on this for 13 years. Thank you all for being part of that. So we really appreciate it. We love what we do. Love uh, commentating and also talking about what's the most important stories and, and sharing our insights. Um, so we'll get it to it, Dave. So the, the, the big thing right now to me is you got Mobile World Congress coming up. We're going to have a cube set there. You got KubeCon happening in in Paris coming up. That's another big event. Uh, you got RSA around the corner. So the first half is lining up and you're starting to see the trajectory. And it's very clear to me that the AI from last year's hype is moving into a discussion of how this is going to impact architecture. Again, this is not... New to us, we've been talking about this, but you're starting to see real substantive conversations around where AI is going to fit in. And with all the hubbub and all the the, the hand waving from OpenAI, which by the way, they're doing really good, they got traction, there's a, now a shift to the infrastructure side where there's a lot of build out going on. You're starting to see now tell signs coming into the market where the real work being done is going to be on the infrastructure side. So this is actually right in line with what I think is going to be the big aha moment for the industry. And that is once the infrastructure is enabling this disruption, the app tsunami is coming. You're going to see general purpose apps out there. You're going to see a lot of different things. And so I found that very um, rewarding because I was nervous. I'm like, where are the workloads? <laughs> you know, at reInvent, we're, we were squinting through reInvent saying at, at AWS, what's going to happen? And it's clear. Now, that being said, the enterprise is a different animal than, say, the consumer. But let's just get into it. So I copied you on this tweet um, with Naveen Rao, who's now at Databricks, Cube alumni, multiple times, multiple ventures. 
He says the enterprise generative AI wars are going to be fought on primarily two fronts. The enterprise gen AI wars, two fronts. Number one, office productivity, which is like Google Docs, Office, email, coding in there, co-pilot coding, all that stuff, productivity. And two, data platforms. Databricks, Snowflake, BigQuery, et cetera. This will include opinionated platforms like Salesforce. There will be vertical solutions, but that will be a bunch of splintered markets. Interesting commentary, Dave. Mm, and very interesting. This is in oh. line with what we've been researching on the six data platform, is what we've been saying on the app tsunami coming. Again, the interplay with Naveen's uh, insight is this is the, the, the two dimensions uh, productivity and infrastructure where data, he didn't even mention like anything like any scale or companies that are building infrastructure or the cloud players. He said data platforms, no cloud, no Dell, no HPE, no NVIDIA, no chips, data. Um, your reaction to that? So because I, I found that tweet extremely perfect for me this morning. I'm so retweet okay, it. <laughs> a perfect, perfect uh, red meat. Um, so I agree with them on the office, you know, productivity side. Yeah. He's right. Personal productivity. That's the amazing thing about this AI boom. It's not just one or the other. It's both. Cloud was really, you know, IT productivity, right? And innovation, new apps. And PCs were all about personal productivity. This is both. What I take away from his comments, really, um, on, the, on the latter, on the data platforms, is what he's essentially saying, in my view, is that we're we're moving from a world that is application centric to a world that is data centric. And what I mean by that is for years, we've really been, a, ap applications have been about automating processes. And now, <laughs> you said it years ago, <laughs> data is the new development kit. It's, it's, it's really now about building digital representations of your business in real time. So that's gonna take a new type of data platform. Yeah. The other piece of that is, the other, the other subtext here is that Data and metadata today are locked inside of applications. And what he's saying is that's splintered. And if we continue to go down that path, it's just not going to deliver the results that we need. What we have to have is a data platforms that span, that transcend all those different applications and provide uni a unified data layer that all applications can get access to that are both accessible and coherent. Now, here's the problem with what 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 he's not what he's not saying is that means all data, including transaction data. And when you think about Snowflake and Databricks and other OLAP and analytic engines, they're really all about analytics. They take transactional data from the the system of record, the transactional system of record, then they move it into the the analytic system. Snowflake says, bringing it to Snowflake. Databricks basically says, hey, we're all open, but essentially where's the transaction data here? And that is the really hard part. Doing that in real time and governing it is this holy grail. Now, what Databricks announced last year in June was they basically took their, their biggest weakness, which was their database, and they turned it into a strength by saying, hey, we'll work with all data. And it was actually a genius leapfrog move and now you're seeing, you know, they made an AI acquisition, Snowflake made an AI acquisition, and now everybody's sort of scrambling to be that next data platform. And then we've talked about the sixth data platform, which we think is bubbling up with a lot of different startups, extensions of guys like Databricks, Snowflake, AWS, Google, and Microsoft, the whole Gen AI piece. So we think there's this new emergent capability that not only separates compute from storage, but separates compute from data, meaning all compute can get access to all data across not one vendor's com compute and data uh, uh, and storage. Sorry, I said com separating compute from st uh, data. I meant separating compute from storage was the fifth data platform. Separating compute from data, all compute gets access to all data is the vision that we have for the next generation, long-winded, but hopefully that made yeah. sense. Yeah, it, it did make sense. I mean, this is what we're, what we're, we're chronicling on the cube is the data super cloud, what we call super cloud layer is emerging. And again, the stack is evolving back to kind of almost its roots, Dave. You got infrastructure, middleware, and applications, a kind of generic three layer stack. 
um, AWS kind of present, presented their AI stack essentially in that same format. And if you look at the data part of it, all the innovation, in the chips, okay, look at um, the innovation, in the chips, NVIDIA, CPUs, TPUs, all are enabling data. So the data layer will become the most important thing to work on from an architecture standpoint. It's the one that's most impacted by AI. It's also the one most important that feeds AI. So data and AI are like go, go hand in hand. And if you get it right, it's a great form. And if you get it wrong, you could blow up in your face. It really is. You don't want to mix those, you know, those ingredients together because it could be a tinder box if done wrong. So, but if you get it right, it's explosive in a good way. So that's really cool. That also ties to the fact that if you look at uh, the news I mentioned at the top, which is Meta announced that Hock Tan was one of the new board members of Facebook or now Meta. That's interesting. And I wrote a comment on, on, on Hock Tan because we're um, friends on LinkedIn. Um, and I said, hey, you know, there's a lot of new experiences with Facebook's Meta's new AI, the success with Llama and, and AI is doing great with, a, with Facebook. Um, that's going to create new experiences that's going to need more chips and more software, which is the business he's in. So Zuckerberg then came out and said, I really value, I really value um, Hock Tan because for the reasons I said on the post um, to Hock Tan, but he also pointed out that he wanted him on the board this because he was one of the leading advisors last year when he went through that year of efficiency, which was basically we're going to cut people and be more profitable. Because if you think about Meta, how much they were spending, they were just like drunken sailors, just like spending everywhere. So essentially, you know, deep experience in silicon uh, and infrastructure and software, Octane is a perfect fit. I'm sure Meta is going to be a big customer, Dave. Of, so, of them. So a good fit. So, I mean, Hoxan knows how to run a tight ship. He's going to make VMware very profitable uh, with the Broadcom model. I loved watching Meta. It's like they had so much opportunity to cut. And at the same time, they're by the way, they're still spending like tens of billions on Metaverse. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out eventually. But they were able to cut, you know, so much. And then you've seen what's happened to the stock. It's just, it's shot up. And we were talking, I think we were talking about this last week. Google's the only one who hasn't taken that, you know, page out of that playbook. And so who knows, maybe they're just tripling down on innovation and it's going to pay off, or maybe they're going to pull that, that trigger. But interesting, Hawk Tan, somebody said to me today, well, Hawk Tan's really young. And I'm like, well, he's not that young. <laughs> he's older than I am. He's like 71 years old. And uh, they were like, wow, that's surprising. He looks really good. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe he's like Charlie Munger. He's going to be. He's going to be running the company into his nineties. So um, that was Quaz a really... You got Charlie Quas over there who's running his right hand man, running the chips division. You got the software division. I mean, look at they've done extremely well. And again, we've said this many times on the cube. Broadcom is a rising star in the execution of this modern era. They got the chips to the apps, and with VMware, they're going to get that operating leverage on the software side. They have Semantic, CA, and now VMware. And they're going to build security. And it's no doubt in my mind with Ethernet becoming the open standard for ecosystems, the, the importance of the network interface card and how architectures are changing with hardware. It's so clear. And again, no one's talking about this in the industry right now. It is a kind of like a public secret. And we're the only ones continuing to expose it because it's so important. And you're already seeing it happen. The hardware configurations of which was once confined to servers and PCs the chips, the bus, and all the components. That's now the data center, Dave, right? So now the data center is one big PC or server. You got to look at these NICs and these interface points, the switch versus the NIC, what's more important. I mean, you know, we're seeing data that says the NICs are more powerful than the switches. So yep. all this is changing. And again, it's just, this is Broadcom's in a good position. Um, we're going to continue to crock. We're going to see them at Mobile World Congress. Uh, Charlie Kowas is going to come on the cube, and uh, we're going to talk about this. Well, uh, let me let me just say too. It was Cisco announced um, last night. And, you know, not great. I mean, they they hit, they kind of hit, but then very weak guidance, and they're cutting. I think five thousand jobs. Security grew three percent. Um, collab grew three percent. Networking was down in like low double digits. I want to say twelve percent. So we're definitely seeing a shift from like traditional legacy switching to this especially with AI, you've got all these different networks, whether it's InfiniBand or Ethernet, you just pointed out the rise of Ethernet and Ultra Ethernet, but, and this is what's, what struck me was when you're talking about Charlie Cowis, 
I first was introduced to him just online, just searching around, looking for videos. And he was talking about, gave a little tech talk on the shift from a CPU centric world to a connect centric world. I'm like, huh, what does that mean? And he's, this was like years ago. Yeah. And exactly what he's saying is playing out. It's all the interconnections between the CPU, the GPU, the NPU, the accelerators, the storage network, all the yeah. back end and front end networks, all that traffic moving within that network is really where the action is. And that's where Broadcom has doubled down. Yeah. They don't, they don't make CPUs. They don't make GPUs. They make NICs. They make storage controllers, all this yeah. other boring stuff that is very lucrative. Well, boring um, stuff, boring stuff that's actually in stuff that matters. For instance, sensor interfaces yeah. are in cars, Dave. So you've got um, automotive grade interfaces. Those are controllers and NICs as well. Uh, you got hardware security modules for secure data movement. You've got access market. You got from set top boxes to broadband uh, Ethernet, a broadband um, telecom. And then you got obviously all kinds of connectivity at the edge 5G, Wi Fi, wireless. I mean, as these become uh, AI models in the future, Broadcom is going to have chip to software integration layers. That's going to hopefully be set up for, for prime time. That's why, again, this is why I get excited by the Broadcom. We have a huge appetite for this content because it's clearly, it's, it's in the weeds, but it's going to set the agenda for 20 years. And, and, and with that in mind, I want to just share real quickly the Zuckerberg quote, because I want you to get your reaction to this. So Mark's on, this is in common to Hock Tan and this other guy, um, John Arnold from Arnold Ventures, the two new board members of Meta. Let me read the quote from Mark Zuckerberg. I'm excited to share that Hock Tan and John Arnold will be joining Meta's board of directors, period. This is the next killer sentence. As we focus on building AGI, having directors with deep experience in silicon and energy infrastructure will help us execute our long-term vision. Hock, CEO of Broadcom, which is built one of the leading semiconductor companies in the world. I got to know him informally as he advised the Meta team on our year of efficiency. John Arnold, founder of Arnold Ventures, brings expertise in finance, energy, which will be critical as we build out large scale infrastructure to train and deploy future AI models. Look forward to working both of them. All right, Dave, one, so, AGI. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> this is Zuckerberg's North Star. So again, back to the scale of Facebook. If you look at Facebook, with Facebook, or I'm sorry, I would keep on calling it Facebook. I'm still not used to Meta. If you look at Meta, they got Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, variety of other tentacles out there, large scale data centers. They're very Google esque in their scale, very Amazonian in their scale. This is puts them in a position to essentially be a cloud provider for AI and or well, cloud provider, but a huge provider of infrastructure scale. For AI. So to me, I see Zuckerberg clearly going down the road of saying, I'm going to throw the metaverse under the bus for now, all in on AI, open source all the models, get the developers completely hooked on the heroin. Llama's kicking ass. Open source is now almost crossing over with the proprietary models in terms of uptake and functionality. So the, the growth of open source AI models is absolutely a, uh, an important milestone in this market. So, you know, in comes Facebook. They could enable a whole generation of startups and ecosystem to build on top of it. So to me, if you're hot tan, you want to get in close to the close to the action on that because semiconductors will be a big part of that. So people, I think, forget sometimes how influential Facebook has been and continues to be in the enterprise. And I'll go back to one of the earliest conferences we did, John. Do you remember we did OCP? Mm -hmm. um, and compute. And our friend George Slesman, you remember we went out yeah, to visit yeah. George in his data center in Arizona. I think it was in Chandler, Arizona. And he said, Dave, I want you to, to do one of the keynotes with me up on stage at OCP. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ah, cool. And I didn't really wasn't tuned into OCP at the time. So I remember going to that event and I interviewed George. We did a little keynote thing. And then met a lot of customers. And one of my, I, I, one of my um, contacts was a guy at Fidelity. I started picking his brains about this. I'm like, so what does this all mean to you? He goes, we love this because it's going to just commoditize infrastructure. It's going to create open standards and it's going to accelerate what we do. We're going to get the best prices. And that was really, a lot of that was driven by Facebook. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing similar influence with generative AI, with, with Llama. Yeah. 
And then you talk about AGI and the semiconductor requirements. And there's 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 rumors, right, that Facebook's going to actually become the hyperscale cloud for AI, for open source AI, and compete with the other big cloud players, the big three U.S. cloud players. So Facebook is exceedingly influential in this, and they have you know great engineering. You know better than I. Mm -hmm. um, you know when we, <laughs> I go back to Jeff Hammerbarker, right? You know meeting him with, when he was at Cloudera and all the Facebook stories. So, you know they really have been well, a mainstream. Open, open, open compute was Microsoft and Facebook drove that. Yep. If you remember, I do, and 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 so and Intel it, showed up. The, the original CTO of Intel was there. He's yep. no longer and, the CTO. And, so and it's just extremely influential, leading edge. It spawned a lot of startups and a lot of innovation. You know, much in the same way that you know Google, the Google File System. You know, when when that got released, uh, how that changed the world, and you know, so. So you know, I, I really love their open. By the way, source. by the way, the cube was at the uh, inaugural Open Compute yes. Summit. Andy Bechtelstein was there with a the keynote yep. with Justin. What's his name from Intel? Was the CTO. Jay Shree was there. Um, Facebook was there. Jay and Shree from from the person Arista. At, the yep. person that uh, that was presenting from Facebook is now running Lacework. So the CEO of Lacework. So again, the DNA of Facebook and, and by the way, Microsoft, Satya Nadella was not CEO then. And he made the bold move to essentially open source their entire infrastructure playbook, all their, all their IP, he infrastructure, a lot of their IP in the data center side. So that was Satya Nadella's beginning of his run 10 years ago, Dave. Yeah. And so that again, Facebook has a lot of sway because their engineering is so phenomenal and they're at, they are a hyperscaler. They just, people don't, People forget because they don't directly sell to the enterprise, but that may change. Yeah. Well, a lot of good stuff happening. I'm going to get into this quick um, sidebar here from some Oh, wait, comments. wait. Just one other thing. Yeah. Are you, are you going to talk about Zuck and Quest or no? We can, we can if you want. Oh, you I mean, while we're on Zuckerberg, I mean, he, I, I, I just want to say this. I loved how he punched back at all the, like the all-in guys were saying, oh, the, the, you know, Apple Vision Pro is so great compared to Quest. And Zuck's like, well, wait a minute. We got a better product. It's more comfortable. It's it's more mainstream, and it's funny. You know, I, I'm not really into the whole you know headset thing, but the guys, our guys, our production guys, we, we were talking to them before this program, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm definitely going Quest because it's like it's affordable, you know, and it's yeah. and it's good." So I don't know. I don't know if you've used any of those. I, I, haven't, I, kinda... I, I haven't used it. I, got, I was first generation with Google Glass. I'm going to wait until the first rev. I'll probably buy one. But I, I did hear that it, uh, there's a lot of new apps on it. And the Vice had a story. These even porns already has on it, Dave. So the, you know, the adult market, when you see adult adoption, <laughs> gaming, They're always adult, first. gaming and adult uh, content is a true tell sign of, of, of uptake. We'll see how that how that lasts. But <laughs> so it's not really my kind of thing, my wheelhouse, yeah, but yeah. but it's you know a lot of people yeah. talking about it. And you know, look, if if apps are developed, you know, this could be a whole new I mean they're spending what 10, 12, 15 yeah. billion dollars a year, Facebook that is, or Meta, on 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 metaverse. So well, wow. Zuckerberg, I mean that's gonna Zuckerberg's main pay off. Zuckerberg's main point was, you know, he didn't want to he had FOMO. Obviously Apple got engineered their launch and they, that's in, in a very apple-esque way got a lot of people you know clamoring oh look how great it is and everyone went to the store lined up all the nerds went out and got their got their device that's cool but the price point is pretty high dave the the what zuckerberg's doing he's trying to get the price point under a grand you know consistently under a thousand couple hundred dollars for quest versus three thousand four thousand dollars from apple so I think this market's going to need to bake a little bit more. Um, I think it needs to stay in the oven a little bit before it goes totally mainstream, but augmented reality will be a big thing. Um, and this idea of actually seeing and, 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 and computing is cool. I mean, I could see myself driving my Tesla when I get one, I don't have one yet, but I had a self-driving car, you know, commute to San Francisco and put the, the, the goggles on and get some work done, watch a video, you know, and watch the traffic. Or check my, oh my email, God. you know, I mean, we got, so, we have our faces in our, in our cell phones, in know. our mobile phones. We got our, we got our faces in social media, but now we're going to have our, we have a ski goggles on though. No? Yeah, people it, are going to forget how to interact. I, I swore <laughs> with I each said, other. I, I was so wrong on, I'm right at a lot of things, but I'll admit when I'm wrong, I was so wrong on the uh, ear pods. I'm like, no one will ever wear those toothbrushes hanging from your ears. It's such a, it's so terrible. You know, I was totally wrong on that. So yeah, I, you I, could, be, I could you be, may wrong be wrong on this. I could be wrong on this, but you know, my guess is any new experience that's good, 
and productive might work. So I'm holding judgment on this whole scene. You may you may have been wrong about the AirPods, but the, the AirPods kind of suck. You can't you can't have them in and talk to anybody. Every time you and I are on our AirPods, boys, Dave, I can't hear you, or John, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I'm walking with my AirPods in. Let me <laughs> let me actually, pull them out. I, I, I actually love mine, so they're, they're awesome. I would never go back. Yeah, they're awesome when yeah. you're when you're like listening, but when you're talking, they're terrible. Yeah, but versus the this the old you know stringed ones or any any earpieces are all smaller, or cheaper now. But anyway, you but, mean you mean the the hardwired ones? Yeah, when when plug-in. that came out, I had the old you know the white you know string that when you plug it into your iPhone. Um, and when when I went to the earpods, I didn't think that was going to be a hit. It was so. You know, I stand corrected, but again, yeah, it's smaller, faster, cheaper. Tens of billions. Anyway, so I want to get your reaction to this because I just saw a stat on Facebook: one in three men between the ages of eighteen and thirty-four are using Chat GPT for dating advice. So again, oh, back, to, back, back to the AI piece um, and the tweet from um, uh, one. Yeah. Wait, one in three men? What ages? Eighteen to thirty-four. Wow. Are using well, chats for dating advice. I mean, they're all online. They're all on the apps, right? So I can imagine. I, want, I mean, that's actually, why not? For, but I'm not saying dating advice, but like maybe ideation. I mean, that's what chat GPT is great for ideation. But yeah, you got to make it your own and be authentic. But I don't know. I, I think I think it's going to be like, hey, give me some gift ideas. It's search, basically. So it's going to be very interesting to see kind of how that plays out. Um, and again, just, you know, AI is having its moment, you know, and, and I think this is going to be an interesting year, Dave, to see how the how the AI impacts the election coming up. Um, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal this week, uh, published today, five hours ago, the era of deep fakes and the impact of the elections. Um, I have yet to see anything um, yet, okay, that's going to be game changing on the deep fakes. But like imagining the smear campaigns and the misinformation will be amplified with deep fakes. Well, we've seen a clear escalation, 2012, and then, you know, 2016, from, from social media to like mega social media, and then to, to the whole fake news and, you know, all the accusations of Russian hacking. And, you know, you, you, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on from our adversaries. So we're, 2024 is going to be more escalation. I mean, it's going to be a, you know, AI fakes. Um, there's going to be, uh, misrepresentations. People are going to believe what they see and you shouldn't believe anything. You know, like George Carlin used to say, don't believe anything the government ever tells you. Don't believe anything anybody tells you these days. You have to just go out and do your own research and validate it. And even then you, you got to be careful. But I don't know. I, I think it's just going to be more, more escalation and I'm really not looking forward to it, but. All right, you, so you, you tracked the um, Cisco earnings. They just had Cisco live in Europe. Um, they came back, on, filed on Valentine's Day. Um, some people are calling it terrible earnings. I think I saw one post from Futurum that said it was a horrible earnings. Um, they said, essentially, um, Cisco lay, drops uh, on uncertainty layoffs to come, Futurum. So um, that's interesting to see that. What's your take yeah, on? I mean, it, it wasn't a good quarter. I mean, it, look, they were, they've been working through their backlog. They said I'm it's sorry, not going to I'm sorry, be... I meant Futurium. Futurium, not Futurum. Futurium, which is... The future oh, that's our friend uh, Scott Rainovich. Scott Rainovich wrote... He's right. He's pretty, right. Pretty critical analysis post here. But, um, but I mean, look, I mean, they Chuck said two quarters ago, look, we're working through our backlog. They didn't have a great quarter. They gave... They get an okay quarter, but they gave, you know, poor guidance. This time, they basically hit their revised guidance and they gave worse guidance. So their guidance was below consensus guidance. So that's bad. And then they basically look at Chuck Robbins is honest. You know, he says, look, we got to get through this. It's painful. We're going to cut 5,000 jobs. And we're going to, you know, we're going to, we'll get through it and we're going to figure it out. And, and they will, but I would say this, the legacy networking business, you know, this better than I do is under attack. Now you got, you know, get Arista, with AI Mojo, you got Juniper with Mist and teaming up now with HPE, and supposedly that uh, acquisition is on track. By the way, we have Antonio coming on at uh, Mobile World Congress, and we have a CEO of Juniper coming on. Oh, so that's going to be good separately. Uh, but anyway, they're attacking now. You got 
Juniper, HPE, and of course Aruba all going after Cisco. Um, you got all the sort of networking. You just talking about the Nick vendors, all that innovation. So it's like the the you, know, you need switches. You're always going to need switches and routers, but that legacy business is transforming, and it's sort of indicated by Cisco's you know down twelve percent year on year. Uh, they're still, like I say, we're working through some of their backlog. Um, and then you got Extreme Networks, which has a good end to end story. Um, mm -hmm. You got some of these, you got some of these startups like Aviatrix doing kind of, you know, sort of like a, a an NSX. It's good. Actually, we didn't talk about VMware's consolidation of all their yeah. their their platforms, but that could be actually good news for Aviatrix because that makes them maybe a more attractive partner. Um, Anyway, uh, it's like Cisco has had the dominant share of networking, you know, 60 plus percent share forever with giant gross margins. The thing I like still about Cisco is they, that this is not a big surprise. They know this is coming and they're transitioning their business, their SaaS business and their ARR business is doing really well. And so Chuck's done a good job of through whatever organic innovation, changing the business model, bringing in acquisitions. You know, G2 with the WebEx business, even though it's not growing super fast, it's low single digits, but driving software revenue. And that's how they're going to preserve their margins. And so, you know, they got some work to do. No question. It was not a good quarter and the, and the guidance was not encouraging. Well, let's talk about um, the market conditions as we go into Mobile World Congress this month. Okay. We're pre preparing our cube four days on the floor. We're going to be on the show floor. Um, and so... You know, the state of AI in in telecom clearly I've been pumping this out on social and, and my and my on all my channels that this is not a telecom show anymore this is a cloud data show um and telecom will just be just another industry vertical and that's why they called it MWC because mobile world Congress it's not just mobile it's all things connectivity and data is critical so you mentioned some of those uh, power dynamics with networking with Cisco Get flows right into Mobile World Congress or MWC, I should say. Can't even get that right. So, AI investments are remaining low. Suggests it's still early stage, so that's clear from from our data from the Cube Research. Um, the Cube Research also reporting that the customer experience are attracting um, the highest level of AI investments ever seen before. So we're seeing for the first time movement within the telcos and their ecosystem partners, suppliers that they're really looking at the user experience, customer experience with AI because they have data. So that's the number one investment, and that's high. Um, pilots are going on, tire kicking still, lagging a little bit, Dave, we're seeing in the research, but clearly the focus on what the architecture will be and what that AI production environment will look like is critically the number one thing going on. In the, with the alpha geeks out there they're like hey you know what okay we got the customer experience check 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 throw some money at ai yeah customer experience is blah 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 check the box but the hardcore action in ai and telecom at mwc will be how do we run these pilots and what does it mean for my critical infrastructure aka the architecture where's my data do i own it and how do i use it and how do i use that data for a net new revenue stream and that's going to be the key that will unlock to me the stagnation of the telecom industry it's been so slow it's been like moving glaciers you know watching paint dry for a decade it's been slow as hell so i think this is the year telecom opens up wakes up comes out of the deep freeze and says let's roll so, so I am yeah. really bullish on um, MWC and we'll see how the big guys weigh in. What's the implementation plans look like? How are they going to roll this out? What's the ecosystem reconfiguration? Who gets in front of who? It's going to be a, a changing of the guard and changing of positions and leadership in the incumbents. And, and again, I expect new brands to emerge in all inflection points. So in 2021, you and I did the COVID mobile world congress there was like one tenth of the normal crowd and you know during covid we saw the even the more rapid acceleration of cloud migration and it it was really started to begin in in coming into focus at that year 2021 when we were in cloud city 
<laughs> with with Telco DR and Danielle Royston. And they, they were like the the entire MWC, all seven halls were empty except for the former Ericsson space, which she bought out like 60,000 square feet and Cloud City was rocking. And you could you started to see like evidence that the BSS and the OSS systems were going to go to the cloud. And then last year, and then we skipped that. So they had two, right, in 2021. No, they had 2021, and then, which was, I think, July, John, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was July of 2021. And then and they, they did 2022 in February, which we didn't go to. And we did 2023 last year. The, the big themes last year were the disaggregation of the, the telco stack. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Open RAN was a big theme. Uh, private 5G was another big theme. Uh and and of course the the telcos all chirping we can't let this happen again meaning we can't with 5g we have to figure out the monetization we can't just let the ott guys crush us again and then the flip side of that is when you talk to guys like chris lewis uh who's been you know following telco since he was three years old he'll tell you you know what dave the telcos are actually really good at connectivity and they make a lot of money at connectivity and Worst case scenario, they have to just stick to their connectivity knitting. They'll do just fine. And um, but I but I don't think that's gonna satisfy them. I think they want more. And then the last thing I'll say is there's also, in addition to the disaggregation of the telco stack, there's the data stack yeah. that is gotta transform. And so you're seeing AWS, uh, all the the cloud guys, you're seeing Snowflake has a has a bigger presence there. IBM, obviously, with with Watson X. It's going to have a huge presence at MWC. Mm -hmm. MWC is an awesome show. I mean, yeah. it's just everybody's there. Yeah, I good. mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I think the the networking data. I mean, telcos have all the data that in their purview. Okay, and I think they've always used their data. It's not, not like I mean, look at the uh, the uh, the the data play that AT and T really pioneered around making data a business model with with smartphones. Okay, legendary making a value proposition out of the, the exhaust data laying around can be can transformed into a foundation model very quickly from these telcos and, and turned into an input into a better application that's net new. Okay. This is an opportunity. And for companies that want to own their own foundation model data, which is a big power dynamic in AI today, they're going to want to go to a telco and say, Hey, if I'm going to run on 5g on your network, I'll bring my data to the table telco telecom carrier and i i want you to make sure i'm secure just like what amazon's doing with bedrock they're making that customer relationship one that's going to create data value for both parties so that's an opportunity for the telcos to use their data as as a way to make a sticky relationship and a value proposition with the enterprises so i think absolutely this is a net new thing it's so obvious to me it's as clear as day that this is a, definitely a business model opportunity for telcos and it's going to change the ecosystem partnerships that they have so the telcos would rely on certain relationships i think you're going to see them recast um who they work with for things like iot edge you know we're seeing a lot of startups out there that are growing that have this great ai and automation capability that plug right into the new model beautifully and i think that's going to be something that's going to point to the data layer and enable the application market to boot to, to be really robust for telecom where in the past it was just a heavy lift all the telecom companies try to build out the stuff themselves. And you can't take classic network operators and make them platform engineers. That's a failed strategy. And I think I think the realization that that's happened is going to be this year where everyone goes, you know what? We gave it the college try. It ain't working. So dump that plan. And by the way, the stuff that we built is irrelevant now because it's the market shifted. So again, back to the market transitions, this is an opportunity, and we'll see which one of the telecoms players who moves. And it's going to be pretty obvious by the moves they make in the, in the show. So we'll be watching them. With, we'll squint through the data, squint all the noise, and be watching the moves that they make, and we're going to tell who's going to be making the right moves. Uh, and to me, it's back to distributed computing and the data value, and, the, and it's going to, again, clear. And if they don't do it, we'll see. And, this, and then the winners will have more money. They'll have more apps on their network. They'll have more customers. And the customer experience then kicks in after that fact. So that's why I think um, the Cisco thing is really interesting to me. Um, what they do with their networking data, do they own it? And, and we've, we've discovered some of our research that 
you know, Cisco has a position in this market, but they might not be well positioned if they don't have the data. This is a question I want to ask them. I wish I was on that earnings call. I would have but hit would have hit the question on that. Um, we'll see. You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. And again, you know, Michael Dell will be coming on the cube in Marvel World Congress. We got Antonio Neri from HPE coming on. We're going to have Chuck Robbins a little verbal verbal there. Hopefully, he'll come on. Um, we got uh, action there. We got the Extreme Networks coming on. We got all the CEOs coming on. We got the Broadcom president coming on. Um, love this market from chips to applications, Dave. The full stack so, is is getting back to full stack uh, applications in a whole new cast and a whole new AI uh, way. So, uh, so a couple other things. Pumped. Couple other things I'm tracking this week, if I may. So you saw Lyft's bloop. Uh, they they uh, did when they printed their earnings release. They added a zero to their profit number. <laughs> the stock shot up like yeah. freaking seventy percent for just seconds. So somebody either got yeah. killed or made some money on that. Um, the inflation data came out and it shocked everybody. I mean, I'm I'm so surprised that people are so surprised that inflation is is sticky. It's like everybody's like, oh yeah, there's gonna be a rate cut in the first quarter of May. It's like it's so uncertain right now. And so, you know, inflation continues to to rise. It's you know, okay, so even if it's even if it's three percent, it's it's up so prices are up so high from where they were pre-COVID that you know it's that's something that I think is gonna weigh on this market. But by the way. I also think interest rates are probably okay where they are, even though the Fed wants to get them down lower. We've lived in this kind of interest rate environment for years and decades, you know, prior to, to ZERP. Uh, there was another article that came out in the Wall Street Journal. Yep, that's right, John. Um, about co-pilots and co-pilot testers. This was really interesting. Did you see this? Yeah, um, I did. That So co-pilot testers are basically saying, you know, it's good, but... Yeah, we're really not seeing a ton of productivity. That said, there were a couple of use cases where companies were saying, yeah, we're going to roll this out, you know, across, you know, half our employee base. I will say this. We talked last week about, you know, the year of AI ROI. I made a prediction that 2024 is going to be a year of AI ROI focus, but it's going to be really hard to, to get. And if they don't get it, customers don't get it, spending, tech spending is not going to boom it's not going to you know be there's not going to be a gain share i don't think you're going to see that until 2025 and if you don't see it in 2025 then you're going to start to see cuts on ai i do think you're going to see it but people are like these co-pilots 30 dollars per user per month eh, it's a little rich we'd like to lower the denominator a little bit yeah. so you're getting mixed reports on the co-pilots what's your take on that I think people are going to realize that it's just not worth the squeeze and, and it's going to be same with subscriptions for these newsletters you know, in the journalism business, you're starting to see people unwind their newsletters because they're like they're not getting the, the success they thought, but it sounds good. Oh yeah, I'm going to support that person, the producer. But you can you're going to pay thirty dollars a month or five dollars a month or whatever it is for whatever service. It's fatigue. And as you get so many services, you put your credit card down. After a while, like how the hell did I? What do I have signed up for? So I think there's going to be an element of I'm signing up for too many AI things. Number one. Number two. Sometimes the value is not there and they just go, okay, I don't really like this. I can just get that for free on chat GPT. Like I mentioned, you know, from dating advice, chat GPT has been phenomenal. See how perplexity it does with that in our cube AI. So I think, you know, that's why I'm interested to see how these services work. Will there be a long tail and how that's going to work out? So I think the um, integration of the data also is the other factor. The experiences aren't that great. Yeah. The productivities are hit or miss. So I think we're in just in the evolutionary phase of embryonic growth of stages of the industry. It's early. Some shit's going to work great. Some of it's not. And if it's, it's and, and solution has come in and data is going to be in there. I think it's going to be, it's going to be up and down. It's going to be a seesaw. And I don't, and I don't want people to think that we're sort of down on AI. I think we still think it's down on AI. transformative. We're, we're like, we're like right, drinking we're, from we're, AI Kool-Aid. Of course. We're, but, but we're I drunk think, on AI every day here but, at the cube. But, but, but right. But the point I want to make about that is again, you know, I've, you listen to the guys from all in, they're like, oh yeah, it's, it's like great. You're going to be able to do startups and get to a billion dollars with three people and it, it's to make it sound so easy. It takes work. We know from our own, you know, cube AI, which by the way, the cube AI.com now we've been, we, uh, have we launched this yet? No, it's still in staging. No, we have launched it. And there, you, you can see we, some of the version of we've now, yeah, it's sort of a halfway house right now. We've ingested all of the Silicon angle news data, which is a great, very tight corpus of data. 
there's a little toggle and we're, we're going to blend the two together, but check that out. But my point is it, it takes work. It takes engineering to actually get this yeah. stuff to work. And, and I think what I'm really excited about, so like, I think Microsoft's overplayed its hand a little bit with, oh, you can just make, make it, make Excel sing. And you can say, Hey, I want a double Y axis. And I want to do this, that, and the other thing you try that with co-pilots. It's like, nah, that's not really what I want. And you end up going in and doing it manually. So I think they've overplayed their hand. No, a little I don't, bit, I don't like, know. I, I agree with that. Dave. I think they haven't over. I think they're making some good bank on us as open AI. I think it's, it's maturity of where users expectations are. Chat GPT has set the bar so high on expectations that other products just may or may not be worth it. I mean, like I don't even notice co-pilot in the Google stuff. Cause I've already got the auto completion going on. I have all the basic stuff in there. I don't see value. I don't haven't seen the, the benefit of it. So I think it's just evolution. But, so I think that the drop off of subscription rates and satisfaction is just good. Is a different, in well, my opinion, I, different I, set. Like, I think, I, I think it's more like, for instance, just take, take PowerPoint and Excel two really important yeah. personal productivity apps. And to your earlier point about, um, uh, the, the gentleman from Databricks was, was it was who was that was it Ravine? Ravine, yeah, yes, yeah. So Naveen, the, Naveen, Naveen. Sorry, two big personal productivity platforms, PowerPoint and Excel. And if you, you if you if you try to apply co-pilots to really make you more productive it's still uh, still not quite there. It's 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 probably a little bit better for Excel, not great at all for PowerPoint, and so. There's upside there. I just, when I say overplayed their hand, when you watch the demos, they're really impressive. Yeah, yeah. When you actually try to use them, it's like, eh, not quite there yet. So I think there's going to be some pushback on that, that pricing, yeah. that co-pilot pricing. And, and, and I, um, I, I do agree with them, but I think it's, 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 they're, they're groping for where the market is, but clearly the category of productivity software clearly is where the innovation is going to be. If well, not, full transformation what, of that market. What what I'm saying is, so I think you're going to, I think you're going to have a very clear combination of where using AI as co-pilots or embedded into applications. And it's not an, or it's an, and we're going to do a lot of our own AI development in house for our specific purposes. I think it's going to be a big and, uh, is I guess my point there. Um, the other thing to switch topics is Buffett trimmed, Berkshire trimmed its Apple holdings somewhat. I think the reasoning was it was just getting such a big portion of their portfolio. But the thing that was always strange to me is he sold his tech, uh, his TSM, his uh, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, uh, Manufacturing, sold the TSM because of the China risk. Well, I would think Apple is facing that same China risk because their vast majority of their chips are coming out of. Yeah. TSMC, if not all of the, the the leading edge chips. So that was kind of interesting news. And the other big news is Bitcoin hit almost 53,000 today, which is only about 20% below its high of a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's back. The hype is back into uh, Bitcoin and crypto, which of course I love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot, yeah a lot, great stuff that you're following there i've been following all that too and, and love the commentary for me i i'm gonna go off the board a little bit because obviously we were hi highly influenced this week by the super bowl and uh the super bowl viewership rose to 123 million uh new record high um kept a huge rating pull obviously many reasons why san francisco and kc you know big dueling you know brands and also table swift factor good um, game Great game. Disappointing from a, a Niners perspective. Obviously, I'm a Patriots fan first, even though people see me with all the Niners stuff on social because I've been living in here 23 years. Kind of adopted the Niners as my second team. And Davis, AFC, it's not an AFC team, so Patriots are still there too. But we're all bummed. It was a bummer. They could have won. Miscues, a couple of miscues, but they could have won the game. But a great game. Super exciting. Uh, disappointing for the Niners fans uh, and um, Brady-esque for uh, the KC Mahomes. fans. And I think Mahomes put on a Brady clinic. And I think, you know, it was, he'd stepped up for sure. You can't deny that. He ran for that first down when the game was on the line. Can I ask uh, you a question? Yeah. Sorry to, to interrupt. But as a Patriots fan, like I know I, I like snapping out every Super Bowl because they're all close. How are you? Because you're, you're a Patriots fan first, but you like live in the Bay Area. So a huge yeah. San Francisco fan as well. Um, were you snapping out? 
at that game? Are you more like... No, I was really into it. It was, it, was, it was super exciting. I mean, it was like a game that was really on pins and needles, literally standing up and watching it at the end. It was really that exciting on TV. So I thought that from a football standpoint, it was super awesome, right? But were because you like it, nervous as a fan? No, it was, just, it was exciting. It's like I was ner nervous in the sense of, hey, stop them on fourth down. Of course, Mahomes just runs for the first down to get that key first down. And then, you know, they had that holding penalty um, yeah, in the overtime that put him from first down to second and, and 20. That killed, that made them force them to kick the field goal. And obviously, they missed an extra point. So a lot of these little things kind of add up. But in the heat of the battle, Christian McCaffrey never fumbles. He put the ball on the ground the first possession. So, the, and, and the, by the way, the, 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 the Chiefs weren't moving the ball at all. So it wasn't like it was a blowout. It was just a seesaw, just a great football. I mean, classic, great football. So as a football lover, I love, I thought it was good. And yeah, okay. Fan, but so, this, and, and so as it's a, not. And as, and as a fan, just why I'm like the Niners, um, in 1985, I went to Super Bowl 19 where the Niners beat the Dolphins. It was a family trip. My father won a church raffle, put, you know, the $5 in, wins the big prize, luckily, lucky, lucky kind of thing. And so, you know, I've never, I'll never forget the Joe Montana experience at Stanford Stadium in 1985. And then, so I've always had that little Stanford, I mean, uh, San Francisco vibe. And then moving out here, obviously they're in the area and that's just a great team and cool. So, you know, I, I saw no conflict with the Patriots love, but obviously watching them win. I mean, obviously I moved out of the New England area before they won any Super Bowl. So it was fun to watch them as a fan win it, but I wasn't there. So, you know, <laughs> it was like different. Yeah. So, well, I'm well, excited. So, I'm, I'm excited for the Niners in the sense that they made it their hometown team, but people were bummed. I mean, people were definitely. We, I can see it. I mean, we were all. I mean, I think I said last week, everybody in New England, not everybody, but vast majority of people in New England are rooting. We're rooting for San Francisco, myself included, because we don't want Mahomes and Kansas City to break the you know the Brady dynasty, and so we just you know we're very parochial in that regard. But I did do this. I did make a fairly not a sizable bet, like you know. But decent. I don't bet a lot in football, but I did an in-game bet when Kansas City was down ten zip because I said Mahomes just can't bet against the guy. So you know how you could do in-game betting. So, and I got a I got plus three fifty on Kansas City, and they, that was my consolation prize because I still, even though I had a a bet on it, I wanted San Francisco. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, you asked me, Brendan just sent me a text. Our producer said Mahomes is on pace to finish with a better career than Brady. So let me ask you a question. Oh, please. I, 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 I mean, know. Let's I know. Hold on. Don't lead the Hall Don't lead the Don't go there. Hey, hey, hey. My question He's to in you, the Hall of Fame already. Like, my Oops. question to you is as a New England fan, are you rooting, actively rooting against Mahomes to preserve? You know, I team? used to, but no, I'm actually I'm a Mahomes fan. I think he's it's amazing yeah. to watch. Yeah. Um, I, I I like San Francisco. Honest, cause, cause, you're being truthful no, than that. You're being intellectually honest here. No, I am. I, I most New England fans I, are like I, screw him. I can't be. I, he's so awesome, though. I mean, yeah. I was definitely rooting for San Francisco. I mean, I love McCaffrey, and and I don't ever root for NFC. I'm an AFC guy, but I was rooting for San Francisco, even though I even though I had a bet on him, I would have been happy to to lose the the little money that I bet. Um, by the way, but, on, the, on the betting front, the estimation was the wages were estimated to surpass $23 billion. So how can we not get this thing legal? I'm telling the NFL doesn't have, aren't wetting their beak in this deal. So, you know, they they collected about $125 billion from selling broadcast rights over the next decade. The plus, NFL, NFL is a fucking machine. I'm sorry to swear, the, but like they're like out of control. Plus the in-game betting is amazing. So the... the just for people, I don't, I never knew much about this. My son was into it. He started telling me about it. I never even knew, oh, this is so embarrassing. I never knew what the money line was. Like when we used to bet with bookies, you get, okay, you get plus two and a half or you get minus two and a half. That was it. And you'd make the bet. Well, the money line, you can bet the team to, to win outright, no points. And you get whatever, plus 110 or plus 150. So the, before the game, Kansas City was two and a half point underdogs and the money line was plus 110. But during the game, when they were down ten zip, it's the when the money line went up to plus three fifty, meaning bet a hundred, you win three fifty, and so the they were way better odds. You know, same game, right? And yeah, so yeah. it's awesome. so much fun to bet. In to your point about the NFL taking a lick off the cone, the people stay and watch. I mean, even if there's a blowout, they're going to stay and watch because they're making in-game bets, and so <laughs> they're making tons of dough off yeah. of betting. Yeah, so. And making it more explosive, you know. Look where the game was this year. It was in Vegas. 
Yeah. <laughs> Hello. So we interviewed the um, CIO for the Oakland Raiders. I remember we interviewed that person. And remember they said to us, we were last place in monetization. At the bottom of the barrel, <laughs> Oakland Raiders team was the worst in the league in, in making money. Okay. Old stadium, decrepit market. They were, you know, it was Oakland, wasn't San Francisco, city by the bay. Weren't really faithful to the Bay, as it turns out. Go to Vegas. Before the Super Bowl, Dave, before this year, guess what number they were? Fourth. Wow. So I, and again, wow. Vegas, new, new stadium, all the amenities, F1's coming to Vegas. Vegas is a sports town. It will be a media town in the future. Um, it's just got all the hotels. I mean, Vegas will continue to thunder away at, as the destination for marquee events. And so... You know, um, you're going to see more of that. And again, again, you own the stadium, all the money they're making, and the betting, all the gambling, all the side activities, activations. It's just a corporate promotional dream. So there it is. The last to first, all in venue. And then, and then so the economics going to drive a lot of the sports. It's going to be, you know, you're seeing that with the with NCAA. You know, the whole realignment, the Pac-10 going away. It's like, it's a money game now, Dave. Money game. Oh, so money's off the charts, man. But and I have to say, it makes it makes it fun. I used to, I, honestly, it's terrible to say. I'm very parochial here in New England. I used to never pay attention to to other teams other than you know during the playoffs. And it just the 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 betting makes it fun. And I don't bet a lot, um, but you know, ten bucks here, fifteen dollars here. <laughs> but it's fun. It makes it exciting, you know. And so, and and also the thing I love is where's the value, right? Yeah. Like, so well, I don't know. Well, Dave, we're running over time. It's late there. Uh, Thursday night here, we're getting this recorded early, normally on a Friday. As we have our travel schedules coming up, you'll see us produce the podcast earlier. Uh, go to siliconangle.com, uh, episode 47 in the books. Um, we'll see you uh, around, Dave. We're going to next time I'll see you in person, Mobile World Congress, and certainly next week, Thursday in the pod. But get ready for Mobile World Congress, Dave. We're going to all right, John. We'll there. see you there. All, all right. right. Thanks, everybody. Let's close it out.